all stand and as we worship God in responsive reading this morning. Psalm 72, 1 through 8. Psalm 72, 1 through 8. Responsibly. Give the king your judgment, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor and the people. He will save the children of the needy. They shall fear you as long as the sun and the moon endure throughout all generations. You shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish, and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. You shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Dear Lord and Father, we thank you for being who you are, being in control of every situation and all these things of the earth. We, we pray, Lord, that you would um, be with us this morning in our service, that you would open our hearts to receive what you have prepared for us today. We pray that um, you would be glorified, the gospel would be preached. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Well, praise the Lord, and uh, it's good to be up here again to be able to preach. I, I did not expect any of that this morning, so I'm a little verklempt, but uh, very, very thankful. Thankful um, to be here three years. It, it seems like it was just yesterday, and three years is not that long, but it's an incredible honor, again, like I said last week, to, to be able to open God's Word, to be able to preach, and and to be able to um, serve the Lord and to serve one another and serve you folks here, it's an incredible privilege and a blessing. Uh, to see little ones uh, reciting the Word of God, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. So, um, you know, here this morning I'm in a portion of Scripture in the Acts of the Apostles, and sometimes things are not as they appear. If we look back at the history of the Reformation, <laughs> Things were not as they appeared. That one little priest in, in Wittenberg, Germany, could just uh, put 95 theses on a castle door so that he might just have some debate about what was going on, share his heart. But God in the background, things didn't appear as though they were. God used that one man and, and that very event to set off the Reformation, which the echoes and the effects of which we still feel today uh, in our midst. Uh, God working when things don't seem as, as, as they appear. Things are not always as they appear. And as we looked at last week, the idea of the sovereignty uh, and sphere sovereignty in the world, I think my last point was looking at the sovereignty of God. You know, sometimes you look out at the world and it doesn't appear as scripture says it is. It doesn't look the way the word of God appears. But you have to remember, we can't look just with our eyes. We have to look at the word of God. We have to look, because you know what? When you look at the world, it looks a certain way, this way. But when you look at it with these lenses, it appears quite differently. Yes. 
And what I want to look at today is this idea of who's in control, who's, who's, who is the king, who is the potentate, who is the sovereign. You know, last week we talked about civil government and we looked at the world and, and, and sometimes things seem upside down. And who's in control doesn't appear as who really is in control. And the bottom line of all of it is, honestly, there is only one king, potentate, and sovereign. There's kings and there's kingdoms, but there's only one king, and it's only his kingdom that holds sway in all of the world. And that's what we saw back then in the Reformation, that, that as things seemed upside down and the Roman Catholic Church was out of control, God was working behind the scenes. Things weren't as they appeared. He was bringing apart about his purposes. So as, as we looked at authority and power and, and such last week, we've been seeing the idea that Paul is appealing to King Nero Caesar, the, the king and the power and the potentate of that world then, and we saw that this week we're going to see there's going to be another king that comes along, King Agrippa, and his, his sister, uh, powerful Queen Bernice. And there's going to be pomp, and there's going to be circumstance, and it's going to be uh, uh, amazing, those that gather at that auditorium that day. But things aren't as they appear. Those kings and those queens that appeared to be in control, in reality, there's a much different truth that's in and behind all of these kingdoms and, and peoples and, and, and nations. So today, I, I want you to open up your scriptures. I want to try to work through this again. Each week, it's fresh and new. Um, but I want to take a moment to look at our portion of scripture in Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. Keep that open on your laps. And we're going to start at verse 13. We know from this past little while that, that, that uh, Paul had appealed to Nero Caesar and uh, Fiel, uh, Festus had agreed to this and he's going to send him that way. But before that happens, this very interesting event of Paul appearing before King Agrippa happens. And I want to recognize in this portion of scripture, we're going to have kings and queens and powers, but I want to see that in juxtaposition to the true king and his kingdom and his power. I want to see kings and kingdoms, kingdoms of this world. I want to see the king and his kingdom, the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. And finally, I want to see bow before the king and he shall reign forever and ever. Of course, you know that's from Revelation chapter 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So let's read this together and see if I can't uh, make some sense of what I'm trying to say here. Acts chapter 25, verses 13, and I'm going to read all the way to verse 27. <clears throat> and after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying there's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to the destruction before the accused meets the accuser, accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed, but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appeared, appealed to, to be reserved to the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar. 
Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and the prominent men of the city, at Festus' command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him. I have nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him. Therefore I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So here in this portion of scripture, we have just King Agrippa, who is, excuse me, uh, Festus, who's just relaying to Bernice and Agrippa. They've come to spend a few days with Festus and to celebrate his new governorship. He's kind of brought them up to speed on this curious character, Paul of uh, Tarsus, who's appealed to Nero Caesar, and, and just brought him up to speed on all the points and all the, the, the different uh, parts of the story that's going on. But what I want to do to here is to look a little closer at this one event with all of these dignitaries, uh, Festus the governor, Agrippa and, and Bernice, and all of those that gathered, the commanders, the armies. You know, you think of big events uh, that are gathered and set up and they prepare these events. And, and the fact that King, uh, uh, that King Agrippa and Bernice came to spend time with Festus, they prepared, they prepared the auditorium. They, 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 they decorated it beautifully to, to, to recognize the king and his sister. These were, were dignitaries kings and, and they had kingdoms. They were of high regard of that day. But, but you know, I think about it in these respects. Uh, some of the big, or, uh, uh, those that have been crowned, I think about Queen Elizabeth II and just the pomp and the circumstance and, and how amazing it is and they set it up. But, but that day comes and that day goes and that queen gets older and that king or whoever it is gets older and they pass away. And that day is completely forgotten. So here today in this circumstance, we see King Agrippa with Bernice and they've come with great pageantry and they've prepared that day and they've decorated the auditorium and, and all of the powers are arrayed that day. Uh, and, and here what we see demonstrated in grand scale is, is royalty, the greatest of royalty. King Agrippa, whose great-grandfather was Herod the Great, this was one of the greatest, most powerful men in the world at that time. Uh, their father was King Agrippa, uh, and, and they had four siblings. We'll remember back when Drusilla, uh, who is married to Felix, was there. And, and, and just the, the kingdoms of this world being put on display. Represented here were authorities from Rome and authorities from Jerusalem. The biggest cities of that time uh, represented Things at that time that they would have never thought would have passed away. But those cities, as grand, as, as amazing, as wonderful as they were, they just passed away. Sometimes things are not as they appear. When we look at King Agrippa now in hindsight, we know that, that King Agrippa II was the grandson of Herod the Great who killed all those children in Bethlehem. We don't look back with great regard and, 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 and desire and looking back. It's passed away and it's turned into a bad uh, memory. The son of Herod the Great, uh, their dad, was, as we remember, had put Peter and James and executed James and, and imprisoned John and Peter. He was the same Herod who, on that very day that was all pomp and circumstance in Caesarea, dressed in a silver outfit that shined and didn't give the glory to God, what happened to him? He was put down. He was, he was killed by an angel and, and worms had eaten him. Things aren't always as they appear. R.C. Sproul says this about these characters here in this story. 
that if you looked on the exterior, these are powerful kings and queens, the greatest power of that day. But as, as uh, R.C. Sproul talks about, and again, Bernice and Agrippa are brother and sister. They also had an incestuous relationship. These are supposed to be kings and queens, folks we look up to. Uh, they were interrupted briefly in their marriage when uh, she had left and married another guy. But together with her brother, um, they had pleaded for the Jews with, uh, with the, uh, the rebellion that was going to come in 66. She would end up having an affair with Titus, the very uh, uh, commander of the Roman armies that would dispatch and end up destroying Jerusalem. Just things aren't as they appear. Rome at that time is stronger than ever, and Jerusalem is stronger than ever. But this is feeding down and forward to these things completely passing away. These are a mirage. As, 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 um, as, as you see in that scripture there, that word in verse, let's see here. Verse 22 at the end there, it says, Tomorrow he said, you shall hear him. So the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp, this idea of pomp, that Greek word there, is the word we have for fantasy. The words typically translated fantasy, and so this idea of this pomp, it wasn't as it appeared, it actually was just a fantasy. These folks had no greater power or, 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 or influence than was just simply passing away. You've got King Agrippa, you've got Bernice here, you've got all the commanders, you've got all of the, the dignitaries from Caesarea gathered together, and then you had just this little guy, Paul. This little guy, Paul, and if it said he was balding, he wasn't an, oppo an imposing character. This guy, Paul, by that time, you know, has been beaten many times, struggled and, 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 and put upon. So in, in the midst of all this, you have this, these kings and, and these, those, those that represent a kingdom, but you have just simply Paul in opposition and, and, and in standing before them. Things aren't as they seem. Here then, I, I want to just recognize the crux of the matter. Sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. We have all of them sat to hear Paul speak, but what Paul was speaking about was the eternal kingdom of God. What Paul had been preaching throughout his time, throughout those different towns, was this idea there in verse 19, that there were just some simple questions about their own religion, about this certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. You see, at this very time and space in history, when the Roman Empire is, is at its height, that Jerusalem is still beautiful. King Agrippa II is going to get a work order to, to pave the streets in Jerusalem in marble. So here's simply Paul preaching the kingdom of God and the lordship of Christ, but it didn't appear as though he was the one of real circumstance, a real pomp. But, but the, the real illusion is, is that Paul was standing for and preaching about a king in a kingdom that was coming at that time in space. A kingdom that was going to, we would see Jerusalem swept away. We would see the Roman Empire eventually swept away. Right. So pomp and circumstance, we'd think those were the things that would stand. Those are the kingdoms. Those are the powers. But in reality, they don't. Because you see, they answer to a greater power, a greater authority. We've been talking about sphere of sovereignty, and I want to recognize that all of history was pointing to this very time in space. Uh, these are the times that you, you thought Jerusalem would be that kingdom, but it wasn't. They're going to end up being under judgment. So I think I want to take a little bit of license, but I want, I want to do in, in recognizing the kingdoms of this world that are passing away, then the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ being uh, founded in this very time. Well, when we opened there, we, we, sent, we read from Psalm 22, which foretold of the one true king and his kingdom, which would be over all kingdoms. A rule of righteousness and justice. A rule that would, a rule that would not be fleeting or passing away. It was no uh, passing fancy. It was no pomp. It was no illusion. 
It was an established kingdom that would rule and reign for all time. Jerusalem would pass away. The Roman Empire would pass away. We talked last week about how the history is winding itself. Even in 70 AD, we know Jerusalem would be destroyed, but even Rome itself would not stand. It's a wonder that Constantine would, would bless and, and stop all of the persecution. That was wonderful. But ultimately, Rome would fall as well. But not the kingdom of Christ. That's right. All of biblical history was pointing to this very time. Mm. Things aren't always as they appear. This is, how, this is what's really true. What Psalm 72 pointed to. In his days, the righteous shall flourish in abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is what Paul was, was preaching. This was all of time feeding down to this Christ and this kingdom. What's real and what's true, all those other kingdoms are subservient and passing away. Agrippa, Bernice, they, they would be no more. They would answer to the Lord God. I think about Paul standing before uh, uh, Felix and telling uh, Bernice's sister, Drusilla, about uh, righteousness and self-control and the judgment of the kingdom to come. They weren't getting it. They weren't embracing or trusting or turning to and God brings judgment, and this kingdom is established. There's another king. The whole point of Acts of the Apostles is that there's another king. That's right. Another king, Jesus. That's right. In the times when Caesar was the power of powers in all of the world, simple men like Paul was preaching the real truth mm -hmm. of the real king who came to rule and to reign. Mm -hmm. You know, we look at it, though, and we think, it doesn't appear as such. Yeah, I remember when Jesus stood before Pilate and, and he says, you know, uh, and, he, and he asks him where his power comes from and, and Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. And we look at that and we think the kingdom of Christ is, is just something that's otherworldly. It's something put off for another day. But it isn't. You see, when Jesus says his kingdom isn't of this world, he means his kingdom is settled in heaven. And he would be seated at the right hand of the Father, from which every kingdom and nation and tribe and tongue in this world would be called to bow the knee to this other king, Jesus. In behind this, as you see the pomp and the circumstance of, of Bernice and, and Agrippa and, and all that's going on, the culmination of all time is, is coming into this part here. I mean, we're going to hear next week where Paul gets into the nitty-gritty of what happened and the fact that he's bringing a gospel that's bringing together Jew and Gentile alike, that's establishing a kingdom that should never be removed. But as we look at this, I want to just take a moment, as we talked about sovereignty in the world, the sovereignty of the, the individual and the the, the, the family and the church and the state, and we looked at all of it, I want to look at what all of that, that answers to as we compare here. This another king, Jesus. Daniel put it really clearly uh, in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. I was watching in the night seasons, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one which shall not be destroyed. Things aren't always as they appear. This is the, the paradigm. This is the truth and the reality of what this kingdom that was being preached was bringing into reality. This is the reality we still live under today. You know, so, so at that time, you'd look and you'd think that, 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 that this kingdom that was invisible to the eye had no real power or, or sway, but the truth is, this is the one kingdom that stands throughout time. As Jerusalem is destroyed, as Rome falls away, as we stand here today. You see, we start to think the pomp again. As we look out at our world, it doesn't appear as such. 
It doesn't appear that Jesus is ruling and reigning. It doesn't appear as though he has dominion over the nations. But this is the truth. You can count on this. Revelation 1, 46 says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. This certain Jesus who had died, who Paul affirmed to be alive. This is the risen Lord and King. This is the kingdom that has been established through and in and by Christ. The pomp and the circumstances of that day in Caesarea have long ago passed away. But that prophecy of Daniel is fulfilled and continues to hold sway in time and space. So we see the kingdoms of this world, that they now have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. So now what? Now we must bow before the king, and he shall reign forever and ever. No, we live in a world where it seems like everything else is in control. It seems like there's other kings, there's other other uh, potentates, other sovereigns. But the truth be told, Christ is ruling and reigning today. The problem is, we don't have eyes at times to see it. We're distracted by all the pomp and circumstance. Things are not as though they appear. James Montgomery Boyce says this, When we see the impressive things of this world, they usually seem to be what is lasting or stable. Indeed, what could be more stable, more impressive, more weighty than the Roman Empire in the person of those who represented it? Yet Luke is suggesting it was all fantasy, all even then in the process of passing away. The pomp and the pageantry passed away first. They did not even last out the day. The servants removed the flags and it was all over. In time, the people also passed away. They died. As I said, and James Montgomery Boyce said, eventually the Roman Empire passed away. That's right. But Jesus has not passed away. He's ruling and he's reigning today at the right hand of the Father. All power, all authority, all the dominion been given to him. When you look at that scripture there in Daniel, that's a picture of what occurred. You know, we so often look at these kingdoms' prophecies and we put it off to another day. We think of it for a future date and a future time. But that's the prophecy of what the kingdom that was being preached, that was being established. Then when Jesus died, was buried, rose again, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. That ancient of, ancient of days is the Father in heaven and the Son of God being brought near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, a kingdom that is, is here today. Uh, it's just, no, no, the kingdom is just this little thing where we just preach the gospel to a couple and pray that they might get out of it, and someday we'll all die and go be with Jesus, and we'll be in heaven, we'll play harps together. No, the kingdom of God has been established in Christ, those prophecies, those promises that we read right out of Psalm 72, that we see in Daniel, that we read uh, spoken of in Revelation, are fulfilled in Christ. In Revelation 11, 15, it says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. This is not hyperbole. This is not illusion. This is not a mirage. This is truth. That's right. The question is, are we going to bow to this king or are we going to rebel against this king? The question is, are we going to come in subservience and serve him or are we going to rebel and be squashed? I talked about Jerusalem. We see Jerusalem represented there in that text. We see throughout the whole New Testament that where did Jesus go first? The kid said it. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. But to them who receive him, to them he gave the power to be the children. But he went forth and they rejected him. They brought the gospel first by Peter right to there in Jerusalem. 
They heard the gospel. There was a people that was drawn out. But by and far, what have we seen? They persecuted. They rejected their Savior. They were in agreement when he was crucified. They were, and they also uh, persecuted the apostles that would come forward. Very much what Jesus says this. When they were there, the apostles with Jesus at the, the temple, that beautiful, grand temple uh, with, with, with just all the amazing marble and beauty. It was, it was one of the most amazing sights in all of the world. And the apostles sitting there telling them, look at these beautiful stones. But what does Jesus say to them? Do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That is what appeared to be permanent. But it isn't. It's Christ and his kingdom that was permanent. Either you repent and turn, or he dispatches those. So we look at this kingdom that's established and the idea that we're called to bow to this Christ and serve him, this is not put off for another day. This is something that then began and has been being worked out in time and space. The most quoted text in all the New Testament is Psalm 110.1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So it is today as the gospel of the kingdom is preached. His enemies are being made his footstool. His kingdom and his dominion is being extended. Mm -hmm. To in time and space and in, in, in nations and peoples and tribes and kindreds here in America. Either they will bow to his will or there'll be judgment. So things, though, aren't always as they appear. We need to be on the side of God, on the side of his kingdom. He is working out his purposes. Colossians 1, 15 to 18 says this. We read it this morning in Sunday school. He, being Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. That's not a mirage. That's what's real. That's what's true. Christ ruling and reigning today. His dominion as creator Lord over all includes secular and sacred. The kingdom of God extends to all. His church is particularly chosen and elect to preach the gospel, but the kingdom of God and the church are not the same thing. The church is part of the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is over all, over all spheres of influence, over every nation, every tribe, every tongue. Here in America is where we happen to be, and they need to, to submit to Christ. And you can't conflate the two. The kingdom of God is over all. This dominion is in all it's kind of like in that text there, it talks about the rain that comes down. I think we can talk a little bit about the rain that comes down and soaks us, right? This kingdom soaks everything up in its power and it envelops the whole world. The kingdom of Christ and the church are different. This kingdom of Christ is moving forward in all of the world. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and it's in every space and sphere. So we're just being a little deluded now because it appears as though he isn't in charge. It appears as though that we have governments that want to take over and rule and run everything. That, that they've set themselves up as, as king. And, 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 and there isn't another King Jesus. There, there's their rule, their reign, their plan. But honestly, let's not, let's not be uh, uh, confused by the mirage. That's just a mirage. What's real is the rule and reign of this kingdom and this Christ. Montgomery Boyce again says, but the gospel of Jesus Christ to which the apostle Paul was called to bear witness, that's what prevailed. It prevailed not only in that day, but because it was the truth as it was spoken, 
it, it has prevailed decade to come and decade to go and century to come and century to go, millennium to come and millennium to go. The gospel of the lordship and the kingdom of Christ continues. And his rule holds sway. I just think sometimes we have too small of a vision, and I want our vision to be shaped by Scripture. Our vision for what the world looks like and what we can expect and what we can trust in is, is it needs to be shaped by Scripture. The power of the gospel is not going to be some fleeting thing, and this kingdom is not going to just, just drag a few out by their, by their, by their toes and, and then just kind of wane out. And then Jesus will come to save the day. Jesus has saved the day. And his kingdom is here and now. His lordship is over all. This week, uh, as we finished off last week, John, uh, John had mentioned to me this idea of uh, in Vietnam. And we saw it again in Afghanistan where the great America, who had gone there to, to start a war, we ended up just kind of leaving, dragging a couple folks out in helicopters and, and this great force. Instead, that's what it was like. And, and um, <clears throat> Andrew Sandlin is where it came from. I shared this with John this week, but Andrew Sandlin talks about this idea of the kingdom of God. And our idea, I think, as Christians is too small too many times. Uh, he has this embassy roof Christianity. And this is what Sandlin says. Finally, there's the challenge of what I'd like to term embassy roof Christianity. Perhaps you've seen the photos or video of the United States evacuation of the U.S. Embassy in Vietnam in 1975 as the Viet Cong overran South Vietnam. It was a great disgrace and the embarrassment to the United States to have. In effect, we had lost that first war. Diplomats and soldiers and civilians squeezing into helicopters on the embassy roof and even dangling from its underneath skids. But it's a suitable metaphor for how many Christians today see the church in relation to culture. The church is thought to be God's embassy in an increasingly hostile culture that can never hope to recapture the Christ, Christ the King. The best we can hope for is to win over a few of the locals to our otherworldly gospel. As time goes on, even the influence will increasingly wane. And in the end, like Saigon's U.S. Embassy in 1975, we'll dispatch diplomats, buses to collect our citizens and their friends for the, for the final evacuation. From the embassy rooftops, the divine helicopters will rescue the faithful and take them to safety on God's heavenly aircraft carrier. This is sometimes called escapism, or thought to be co coincident with the second coming. This is not the vision of Scripture. That's right. The vision of Scripture is not that we're just going to one day be rescued, a few of us on that rooftop at the embassy. This is a kingdom and a gospel and a power that will go forth and change culture. It's not just to change people's hearts so they can be pietistic, but it's a gospel that will saturate all of, all of culture, from, from state to, to, to the jobs that we do, to the, to the art that we practice. You know, the church just has pulled back. We've pulled back within, the, within our doors of our church, and we leave the culture to go to hell in a handbasket. And the truth is, the power of the gospel is not such that that should be our attitude. We have to have our mind shaped by this Christ who is king. We need to understand that the Great Commission wasn't just to go out to a few so we could drag a couple stragglers. It was to so change people's lives so change the way they live and act in the culture to totally saturate the world as we see it. You know, we see a radical few in our country and around the world given to false gods and idols and, and making the, the government their, their god. But, but Christians, we should be the real shapers and movers. The creation mandate that was given by God that now through Christ being recommissioned to the church, 
We can carry this to the world. He goes further to say this, but the Great Commission ministry is quite different. It plans for victory to reverse the enemy's advance and to retake the territory presently under satanic control. It takes God's gospel promises seriously. Make no mistake, Great Commission ministers know they'll suffer satanic assault and setbacks and that their task won't be easy. But as Jesus was, but just as Jesus' wasn't, but they are buoyed by the confidence that our Lord's kingdom in human history coincides with this present age. When do you believe the kingdom of God begins? Some future time? No. It was established in that first century, and it still holds sway today. It's the power to change us every whit, and it's the power to change the world for God, for his good. The, uh, this should encourage Christians to influence society for divine truth wherever God has placed them, whether it's selling automobiles, writing code, teaching children, designing or painting houses, making coffee, or leading an international corporation. Where sin increased, what? Grace increased all the more. This is the power of the gospel in our age. And I wanted to encourage us, as we saw this little portion here of the pomp and the circumstance, it would have seemed that King Agrippa and Bernice, those were the, the movers and the shakers, right? No, they weren't. It was that little guy there, that little guy on trial, the little guy on the dock who was just speaking up for the other King Jesus. We still remember Paul. And his gospel message has created a whole kingdom. That's right. But it's all under Christ. And it still holds sway today. So let's come up and, and sing our last song here today. I was hoping to encourage us in those words. And just look again with me. The truth, the mirage is not real. Psalm 72, turn to that as we close. That's what's real. Psalm 72. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. This all looked forward to Christ, fulfilled in him. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. As, soon as, the sun, as long as the sun and moon endure. Is sun and moon still going on? Then his kingdom is holding sway right now. He still rules and reigns. And there it is in verse 6. He shall come down like rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish in abundance of peace until the moon is no more. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the power of the gospel. This is the kingdom we live in and under now. This is the kingdom that Paul preached. This is the kingdom that God, that Jesus brought. His name, verse 17 says, shall endure forever. Hallelujah. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. amen. No, no, the whole world is going to be filled with the glory of the enemy. The devil is just going to get stronger and stronger and just persecute us all forever. It's not what scripture shows us. That's right. Scripture shows us a kingdom of Christ that will be extended, that will hold sway and will change the, the, the whole sway of history. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your... Uh, goodness. God, for your kingdom, your power.